The Sixth Patriarch's Dharma Drew Platform Sutra, a general introduction. Edited by Bishu Fahai of the Tang Dynasty, what follows is not the sutra text but an introduction to the sutra which was written by the Sixth Patriarch's disciple Fahai. When the Sixth Patriarch taught Dharma, Master Fahai followed him regarding all of the things the Patriarch said. Later, he compiled and edited his notes, calling them the Sixth Patriarch's Dharma Drua Platform Sutra. Had he not done this, we would have no way to study the Sixth Patriarch's Dharma. Therefore, we should certainly be grateful for such compassion as his. Dharma Master Fahai's late name was Chang, and his common name was Wen Yun. He was a native of Chuchang, which is about 10 miles from Nanhua Monastery. He was a room entering disciple, that is, a disciple to whom the Master had transmitted the Dharma. Though his introduction is not part of the Sutra proper, I will explain it to you because it narrates some important events in the life of the Great Master. Text The Great Master was named Hui Neng. His father was the Lu, was of the Lu family and had the personal name, personal name Xing Tao. His mother was of the Li family. The Master was born on the eighth day of the second month uh, the year Wu Xu, in the twelfth year of the Chen Quan reign of the Tang Dynasty, AD 638. At that time, a beam of light ascended into space and a strange fragrance filled, uh, filled the room. At dawn, two strange bishops came to visit. They addressed the Master's father, saying, Last night, a son was born to you, and we have come to name him. It can be Kui above and below Neng. The father said, Why shall he be called Kui Neng? The monk said, Kui means he will bestow the Dharma upon living beings. Neng means he will be able to do the Buddha's work. Having said this, they left. No one knows where they went. The master did not drink milk. At night, Spirits appeared and poured sweet dew over him. Commentary The Great Master refers to the Sixth Patriarch Hui Nong. The Master's merit and virtue was great. He had great wisdom and compassion and was so, uh, so was a master of gods and humans. When one is alive, one has a personal name. After one dies, that name is avoided. Hence, it is called a personal name, a name which is not spoken. When the great master's father, mother, gave birth to him, a fine beam of light arose, like that which the Buddha emits from his forehead. A strange, fragrant incense which had never been smelled before filled the room. At dawn, the heavens are half dark and half light. True, see. In the Song of Household Affairs wrote, A dawn get up, sprinkle and sweep the hall, the inside, the outside, you must clean it all. In China at that time, there was no linoleum. In the morning, people sprinkled water on the mud floors, waited a bit and then swept their houses clean inside and out. The two strange bishops were quite different from ordinary people. They were like the fourth patriarch, who, by merely opening his eyes, caused everyone to tremble in fright. These two unusual bishops came to name the sixth patriarch. Isn't this strange? Who has two bishops come to name him? To say above and below when referring to a person's name is a most respectful form of address. At the newly born, Patriarch 8 was sweet too. Text He grew up and at the age of 24, he heard the Sutra and awoke to the way. He went to Huang Mei 
seek the seal of approval. Commentary: Some say that the sixth patriarch was twenty-four; others say that he was twenty-two. As the Chinese count, he was twenty-four, and as the Westerners count, he was twenty-two. Whether he was twenty-two or twenty-four is not really important. When the sixth patriarch heard the layman recite the Diamond Sutra and read the line, "One should produce that thought which is nowhere supported," the sixth patriarch said, "Oh, no, not supported anywhere." He was immediately enlightened. A great many people had heard the Diamond Sutra, but none of them had become enlightened. Now in the West, perhaps someone will hear. One should produce that thought which is nowhere supported, and understanding the principle, become enlightened. That is what I hope. Whether or not it will actually happen is another matter. After becoming enlightened, he did not say, "Ha!、Ah, I am enlightened." He was not like some people today who do not understand even a hair's breadth of the Buddha drama, yet claim to be enlightened. The ancients, even when they had become enlightened, did not recklessly say, "I am enlightened." Even less would people who had not become enlightened claim to have done so. It is necessary to seek certification from a good knowing advisor, a person who has already awakened. That is why the sixth patriarch went to Huang Mei to seek the fifth patriarch's seal of certification. Enlightened ancients do not attempt to certify themselves today. However, there are those who have not become enlightened and yet say that they have enlightenment. And non-enlightenment are as different as heaven and earth. Moreover, many naive young people take still fine drugs and claim to have gone to the void. Confused demons posing as good knowing advisers certify them, saying, "Yes, you have attained to emptiness. However, there is no place for you to live in emptiness. Come back, come to my place. I have buildings and houses. I have a commune." The young people say that's not bad at all. They take the demons as their teachers. Ultimately, these bad knowing advisers. Do not know themselves if they are true or false. You and I do not know either. But now we should use the sutras for certification. The sutras do not say that any foolish person has a commune in empty space. Even the rockets now go to the moon space. Their settlements have not yet been built. So this kind of talk simply does not get by. Now we are exceedingly busy. In the morning, everyone gets up at four o'clock to recite sutras. We are busy building houses on the earth, not in heaven. Why? We are people on earth, and so our houses should be built on the earth. We are forging our bodies into indestructible vera bodies. Our bodies are our houses, but they sometimes go bad. Now, from morning to night, we are busy constructing them, cultivating them to be, in the end, like indestructible vara bodies. With an indestructible vara body, you can go wherever you wish. You can go into empty space, up to the heavens, down into the earth, or to the Dragon King's palace. It is very simple, and you do not need a passport or a schedule. You are free to take off at your convenience, but first construct your indestructible body, and you can do it. Text: The fifth patriarch measured his capacity and transmitted the rope and drama, so that he inherited the patriarchate. The time was the first year of the reign period. Long Shuo, cyclical year Qin Yu, A.D. six hundred sixty-one. He returned south and hid for sixteen years. Commentary: After the sixth patriarch left Huang Mei, he had no safe place to live because Shen Xiao's disciples and followers of non-the Buddhist religions wished to harm him. The great master went to live with hunters for sixteen years. 
During this time, no one knew that he was the sixth patriarch. He worked hard practicing dhyana meditation while watching over the animals and birds the hunters had caught, and secretly released the ones which had been only slightly injured and could still travel safely. He had much time to cultivate and perfect his skill, for no one came to trouble him. If you do not truly cultivate, everything is easy, but if you do cultivate truly, German obstacles arise from the four corners and the eight directions. Unexpected circumstances prevail, and things you never dreamed could happen do happen. In his 16 years with the hunters, the sixth patriarch dwelt without a disturbance, living just as they did. That is genuine hiding. He did not seek fame or profit, and he did not try to take advantage of circumstances. He practiced genuine cultivation. Text On the eighth day of the first month, in the first year of the reign, period 1 from AD 676, the cyclic, uh, cyclical year Ping Tzu, he met Dharma Master Yin Tzu. Together they discussed the profound and mysterious, and Yin Tsung became awakened to and united with the Master's doctrine. Commentary They talked back and forth, querying each other on principle, who asked whom. Dharma Master Yin Tsung asked the Great Master the Sikh Patriarch. The Great Master had solved the dispute over whether the flag or the wind moved by explaining that it was the mind that moved. The drama master Ying Tsung had been astounded, astounded to hear a layman speak in such a deep and wonderful way. He got down from his drama seat and escorted the sick patriarch to his room for a chat. Where did you come from and what is your name? He asked. Drama master Ying Tsung knew that this layman was a room entering disciple of the fifth patriarch, one to whom the fifth patriarch had transmitted the Dharma. He immediately bowed to the great master. They then investigated the profound and mysterious. They talked about the wind and the flag until his talk with the sixth patriarch. Dharma master Yin Tsung had not correctly understood the principle of the Dhyana school. Text On the fifteenth day of that month, at a meeting of all the four assemblies, the master's head was shaved. On the eighth day of the second month, all those of well known virtue gathered together to administer the complete precepts. Vinaya Master Chu Kuang of Si Ching was the precept transmitter. Commentary During the week of the 8th to the 15th day of the first month, Dharma Master Ying Tsung gathered the four assemblies together the Bishus, Bishunis, Upasakas, Upasikas. The purpose of the meeting was to shave the master's head so that he could leave home and become a Bishu. People leave home for various reasons. Some find it difficult to obtain food and clothing. They see that those who have left home are well provided for, and so they leave home so they can eat and be clothed. Others leave home because they are old and have no children. They think, I will leave home and take a young disciple who will care for me as a son would. It is uncertain whether people who leave home for these reasons can really cultivate. Some leave home because they are bandits or runaways. They leave home and cut off their hair so that the government won't fight them and cut off their heads. Some leave home once more, but it is not certain whether they can cultivate. Some people have confused beliefs. If so, they still believe and that is good. For instance, the parents of a sick child may say, the child may die of disease. We should give him to a temple and he can become a bishop and we can go visit him. That is better than letting him die. 
So out of confused belief, the parents give their child to the temple. People of confused belief may not necessarily be bad, but people who believe in confused principles are definitely not good. They have faith, but it is misplaced. That is confusion within confusion, and it is not good. Some are confused and without belief. In their confusion, they do not believe in anything. Finally, there are the believing and unconfused. These people study the Buddha Dharma with a faith heart until with a faithful heart until they are no longer confused. Of these last four types of people who have left home, one cannot say that any of them will be able to cultivate, nor can one say for sure that they cannot. Perhaps only one or two percent can cultivate the Dharma. However, if you resolve to attain enlightenment in order to end birth and death, you can surely cultivate upon leaving home. Again, there are those who no longer have a family and so leave their worldly homes. So, leave the home of the three realms, the realm of design, the realm of form, and the realm of formlessness. Once out of these three realms, there are no desires, no forms, and no formless consciousness. Because of their non-attachment, these people see the three realms as empty, and so it is said that they have left the home of the three realms. Some leave the home of afflictions. It is essential to leave afflictions behind. If you do not cut them off, you may leave home, but you cannot know the way. The sixth patriarch cannot be put into any of these categories, for he was a special case. He had attained mastery, and so whether or not he left home made no difference. Even when he appeared to be a layman, he practiced the profound conduct of a bodhisattva, and he did not behave like a layman. In this way, his act of leaving home did not resemble that of others in the assembly. The eighth day of the second month of the day is the day when Shakyamuni Buddha left home. On that day, all the illustrious, virtuous, and learned Dharma masters gathered from the ten directions. Chinese Dharma masters and Indian Dharma masters came to administer the complete precepts to the sixth patriarch. Dharma master Yin Tsung invited Dharma master Chu Guang of Sichuan to administer the complete precepts to the sixth patriarch. Si Ching is another name for Chang An. The person who administers the precepts is called the precept transmitter. Precepts have a substance and marker and a dharma. If you wish a more detailed explanation, even finer discriminations can be made. I do not use Ting Fu Pao's commentary because it is often in error. In this case, he says that three people are required to administer the precepts, while actually only one is necessary. At that time, Dharma Master Chu Kuang acted as a transmitter. Chu Kuang was also a Vinaya master, who one who diligently studies the precepts and thoroughly understands the rules. In walking, standing, sitting, and lying down, in each of these four great compartments, he must conduct himself in an awesome manner, not daring to deviate for the space of a single step. Every move a Vinaya master makes must be in accord with the rules. Therefore, the Suragama Sutra says, Severe and pure in Vinaya, they are noble models for the triple world.